Thou hast saved us, O Lord, from them that afflict us, and hast put them to shame that hate us. Words taken from the gradual from today's Holy Mass. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Over the last two Sundays, we've been discussing from this pulpit the two armories. First, there was that armory we discussed that's down in the earth, which is held by the devil and contains Model D weaponry. Things like drink, drugs, division, depression, despair, death, and finally damnation. Second of all, we also discussed that armory which is held by God in His Holy Catholic Church, which contains Model S weaponry because it flows from the blood of Christ, sanguis. There are spiritual and supernatural weapons in this armory like the sacraments and study and silence that make us saints. We determined that we either take up the armor of God and defend ourselves as St. Paul commands, or we will fall prey to the devil's Model D weaponry sooner or later. We cannot just sit idly by on the sidelines of this war. It is everywhere, and it involves nearly everything we come into contact with on a daily basis. We are given armor by God to engage in battle and to win, not to sit around. Now, putting on the helmet of salvation, let us now seek to think with Christ. In order to do this well, let us turn to the 19th century Carmelite mystic, Blessed Francis Palau. We do this to deepen our understanding of this ubiquitous spiritual war in which we find ourselves. He knew a lot about this because he went through several revolutions and very evil things in this country of Spain during his life. He received mystical visions over and over as to how these things were operating. Now, Blessed Francis Palau adopts the imagery of the Apocalypse, chapter 13, as a model of what a full-blown spiritual war or hell's revolution against God looks like. Now, please note, we are not giving uh, this chapter a definitive interpretation, but using its God-given imagery to understand spiritual warfare that is waged by the devil. So let us begin by keeping in mind the previous chapter, Apocalypse chapter 12, one of the most famous of all the chapters, about the woman clothed in the sun, a crown of stars around her head, and a dragon, a great red dragon. So it describes a huge war between the church as the woman and the devil as the dragon. Although the dragon is rebuffed and the church is safeguarded, the devil does not give up, but instead forms a plan. Chapter 13 reveals something of that plan in terms of the dragon and two beasts that he has control of. The first beast sent by the dragon, this is how the 13th chapter begins, is seen as coming up out of the sea or the flood that flowed out of the devil's mouth. You read about that in chapter 12. This first beast makes for a horrible sight, having seven heads for the seven deadly sins and ten horns. Blessed Francis Palau wrote thus, this beast is all the kings and powers of the earth, seduced by the demons, which have shaken off the yoke of the church and have separated from her. And joined to the demons, they form one body, and they unite in war against the church and her pontificate. This beast came out from the sea that is from the world. It was formed from the heresies, from the schisms, from the false religions, with the help of the bad passions of the world. There in the world it sprang up, there it grew and increased, and there it has reached, as you see, 
It has come to dominate all kingdoms, peoples, and nations. Thank you, blessed Francis. Now consider for a moment the first and main error of Russia. Remember Our Lady said the errors of Russia will be spread throughout the world. Well, what's the first and main error of Russia? And from which we can argue all the rest flow. It was this. She split from the papacy and the Holy Roman Catholic Church. Way back there. 1054. At the time of the Council of Florence, that was in the mid-15th century, they sought to heal all these schisms, and they healed quite a few, including that with Russia. But it did not last long. With the fall of Constantinople to the Muslims in 1453, a very significant date, Russia also split away, calling Moscow the Third Rome. We're now the only seat of religion in the world. We're Rome. Third Rome. Now, King Henry VIII of England would follow suit several decades later, doing basically the same thing, splitting away from the Holy Roman Catholic Church and her pontificate. Russia was already spreading her errors. Now, can this ancient split be why the devil chose Russia to be the home of communism? one of the most perfect forms of the revolution against God and his church. So what does communism propose? Or how does it come out practically speaking? It makes the state tyrannical, supreme. You are not going to go against the state. You will die if you do. The state is everything. You must conform. Now, in His Majesty's revelations on the Holy Face to the 19th century Carmelite mystic, Sister Mary of St. Peter, this is in the 1840s, by the way. This is before Marx wrote his Communist Manifesto. Our Lord named the communists in 1840s multiple times as among the greatest enemies of the church. This has been fully approved by multiple popes. He wrote to her or spoke to her, Our Lord commanded me to make war using the weapons of his passion. There's our weaponry. Weapons of his passion. S model weaponry. We're to use these weapons on the communists because he said they were the enemies of the church and her Christ. He told me also that most of these wolfish men who are now communists, had been born in the church, whose bitter enemies they now openly declare themselves to be. What is St. Bernadette said is the most fearful thing on the face of the earth? Bad Catholics. There it is. Bad Catholics. At another time he said, Communists are the ones who have dragged me from my tabernacles and desecrated my sanctuaries. These communists have also dared to lay their hands on the priests of the Lord. Well, why not? The state is higher than the church. I'll lay my hands on those priests if I want to. That's communism. Again, the Savior made me understand, says Sister Mary of St. Peter, that his justice was greatly irritated against mankind for its sins, but particularly for those that directly outrage the majesty of God. And then she lists what these are. That is, number one, communism. Number two, atheism. Number three, cursing. In other words, taking the Lord's name in vain. And fourth of all, desecration of Sunday. We have this in great abundance now. How many nations has communism destroyed? It is in the process of destroying our own nation as I speak. All those who claim to be progressives are really using a new word for communism or communistic ways of thinking and acting. So they're progressives. What are they making progress in? I'll tell you what they're making progress in. It's very simple. They're making progress in destroying God's holy church and her order. Make no mistake, this is true. Also of note is this. 
It's kind of curious. Why has communism not been directly addressed by the church since the pious popes? We've hardly heard the word since then. The answer is simple. It's because communism is now inside the church. There are there may be few who openly profess its creed, but many, many members, even those high up in office, think and act like communists. They openly brag even about saving whole Marxist libraries from being burned. They receive crucifixes, or at least a hammer and sickle with a crucifix on it as a gift, and are thankful. We don't have to profess communism openly. We've arrived. And this brings us to the other beast. The lamb with horns that speaks like a dragon. This beast represents infiltrators into the body of Christ. Listen to Blessed Francis Palau. He says, this beast was like a lamb. It had the fleece and horns of a lamb. And the inhabitants of the earth believed that it was Christ, the Lamb of God. Here's somebody that looks like Christ, seemingly dressed like Christ, lamb skin, has the power of Christ, the horns, but yet there's something wrong. He goes on, And I at first sight thought the same. But looking carefully, I saw that it had claws like a lion and teeth like a wolf. And it blasphemed like the dragon. It received power like the beast with seven heads. And with great marvelous signs made all the inhabitants of the earth adore the first beast. That is the state. That is the supreme thing, the state. Put a bookmark there. We'll talk about that next Sunday. This beast is all the kings, he says, and we could easily add bishops, priests, and religious, who say they are Catholics but are not. And united with one body with the people, they govern. They speak like the demons against Christ and his church and form a league with all the others in the war against God. Think of our politicians who claim to be Catholic. It fits them pretty well. Bad Catholics. They're the thing to be feared. To these powers represented in their horns, Blessed Francis goes on, are united all those Christians who are such only in appearance, but who in reality have neither faith nor true charity, and these are the ones who mixed with the just stir up civil war. They follow the principle of Saul Alinsky to stir things up. The foment revolution inside of a body. That's why it's called civil war. And he says this is all the more cruel because disguised like the lamb, they enter the sanctuary of God and they fill it with abominations. Thank you, blessed Francis Palau. So in the language of the gospel, this beast represents all the wolves in sheep's clothing. It represents the problem of infiltration. You say, Father, you're a conspiracy theory guy. Come on. That's not all this infiltration. Whoa, wait a minute. This is divine revelation. Listen to this. This is from St. Jude. Certain men are secretly entered in. St. Jude, in the letter of St. Jude, you know, it comes right before the apocalypse. He says, certain men are secretly entered in. Ungodly men turning the grace of our Lord of God into riotousness and denying the only sovereign ruler, our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, St. Jude. That's scriptural proof. There are conspiracies and people do enter in and try to do these things and they've been doing it from the beginning. Now we heard about this in the lesson too from St. Paul. He says, many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. He's warning about those inside the church. He says their end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. Now, Bella Dodd, on testimony, sworn testimony, spoke of how the communist 
helped many infiltrate into the various Christian churches in America, including the Catholic Church. Of late has been proven that John Podesta, a longtime Clinton confidant and current chairman of Hillary's presidential campaign, has sought with much effort to what? Foment revolution inside the church. He is on record as saying this, quote, there needs to be a Catholic spring in which Catholics themselves demand the end of a Middle Ages dictatorship and the beginning of a little democracy and respect for gender equality in the Catholic Church. End quote. And then he went on to say, he himself, by the way, is, professes to be a Catholic, but he admits of helping to establish various groups inside the church to foment this revolution. So far, two beasts are in place. Now, third of all, there is the dragon himself. His presence represents the occult, says Blessed Francis. According to Palau, this is where the other two beasts get all their power. This is their armory. In other words, to open the way for the perfection of this ugly war that is raging in our time, many agents and progressives of the devil have paved the way, employing occult practices and principles. Some examples in recent time, we could find many in past times, but in recent times, Russia fell into the 1917 revolution through the instrumentality of Rasputin. Recently, through the public confession of a converted Satanist, it has come to light that many seeking public office turned to the occult for assistance in guaranteeing a victory. He himself did many ceremonies for politicians. And abortion was part of the ceremony. If this is indeed true, and it's been proven true multiple times, can we not see why there may be more reasons than we realize for these officials to support abortion on demand and to keep it legal? They want to keep getting voted in. They need Satan's help. They need a sacrifice. They need blood. The devil's got his sacraments too, folks. And abortion is one of them. What will the general judgment reveal? In any case, we repeat ourselves, this is a spiritual war. It has deep spiritual roots. We're swimming in the occult now. Public black masses, the Goddard opening ceremony, openly satanic. Statues are being revealed for worship of Satan in America. Children are learning about Satan in our public school system. Wake up. It's here. They're all three in place. Seven-headed beast, the lamb with the horns, and the dragon. Why go into all this? Well, I think we can all agree that the main elements of the devil's plan are in place. The states of the world are nearly completely severed from the church and God. Infiltration has taken place with revolution now raging inside the church herself. No wonder why she hardly says anything. With many turning to the occult for information and answers to problems and prayers. All of this shows this war is approaching the perfect revolution. Hell is opened. We are embattled as never before under siege. We must have on our armor and keep it on and use it. And we must seek to defend ourselves. Yet as history and divine revelation prove, if we hold our ground and become immovable in this flooding revolutionary tide, and it's at high tide, we will win. And it will be glorious. St. Paul said in the lesson today, He, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, is able to subdue all things unto Himself, and He will. And so the great apostle goes on to say, Stand fast in the Lord such that our names are in the book of life. We can also turn to the gospel today for yet another image. The world is present around the church 
as the crowd was present around his majesty. And they laughed him to scorn, didn't they? They're laughing us old-fashioned, traditional, medieval thinking, true to our name, Catholics to scorn too. So be it. They think they've beaten us. Thinking the church is like that little girl dead on her bed. But in a flash, in an instant, our blessed Lord raised up that dead little girl and silenced the mob. So too will be the victory for the church and all those who have not departed from her, who have kept on their armor. But let us get a little more practical. As miles Christi, or soldiers of Christ, what are we called to do now? At the very least, we need to defend ourselves and seek as much as possible to what? Limit the evil. Limit the evil. That is reaching a level of perfection at this time. We must seek to limit evil until His Majesty comes to eliminate it altogether. That's something we can do. But He promised He will. And it will happen. But we have to seek to limit the evil as much as we possibly can. That's our principle. Now this is an election year. An opportunity to do this limiting is now present. Some are surely still wondering if they should vote at all. What's the use? I don't like either candidate. That's electable. I'll find somebody else to vote for. I would counsel that voting in this election for an electable candidate who is most likely to limit evil is an act of self-defense against the beasts that are rising up. An act of self-defense. And Pope Pius XII agrees. On at least two occasions, he spoke thus. Wherever vital interests are at stake, and let's face it, vital interests are at stake. Wherever laws bearing on the worship of God, marriage, the family, the school, the social order are proposed and discussed. These are all being proposed and discussed. We've lost a lot of these battles already, but we're not completely lost. Be there on guard, he says, and in action, whenever through education the soul of a people is being forged. Unfortunately, too often in such crises, Catholic organizations are conspicuous only by their absence. One could add, and trad Catholics too. Consequently, there is a heavy responsibility on everyone, he says, man or woman, who has the right to vote especially when the interests of religion are at stake, and religion is at stake in this election. Abstention, in this case, is in itself, it should be thoroughly understood, a grave and a fatal sin of omission. On the contrary, to exercise, and exercise well, one's right to vote is to work effectively for the true good of the people, as loyal defenders of the cause of God and of the church. Thank you, Pope Pius. Interests of religion are at stake. Anyone who doesn't understand that is really out of it. And one can indeed, in this election, vote for an electable candidate, although not an ideal person by any means, who poses the least threat to our Holy Mother Church, who is most likely to limit the evil rather than expand it to the level of perfection. In doing so, in voting so, these people are in fact seeking to limit the spiritual war that is upon us until the words of the gradual come to pass. Thou hast saved us, O Lord, from them that afflict us and has put them to shame that hate us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.